Good morning. All right, all right. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sigmund, and I serve as the executive pastor here. And I'm so excited to uh, be able to share from God's word with you today. Um, I want to begin by telling you a story that's told in the Bible. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's the story of David. Now, David was the very, uh, he was a very powerful king in Israel. And uh, you, you may be familiar with this story once I, once I get into it. But basically, what, what ends up happening is David uh, sends out his men into battle, and David begins to uh, have some wandering eyes from his palace on high, and he sees a very attractive woman. Her name is Bathsheba, and she is actually bathing on top of her house, which was um, how they did that back then. Thankfully, we've, we've come a long ways in our uh, facilities on that. But David uh, has some wandering eyes, and he, he looks down, and rather than turning away, he decides that he wants that woman, and that woman is already married to somebody else, but that doesn't deter him. So he tells one of his servants, go get Bathsheba, and uh, he, they bring her back, and David and Bathsheba, you might say, lay together. <laughs> That's the word we'll use in this company, okay? And so uh, they do this, and this is, this is not good. And, you're, you know, she's married to a guy. His name is Uriah. Now, Uriah is actually one of the soldiers who is in David's army. So he's out fighting David's battle, and David has done this. Well, it, the story progresses, and it turns out that Bathsheba actually gets pregnant. And so now David's like, okay, I think I need to uh, cover up my tracks here. And so what he ends up doing is he actually uh, calls Uriah back from the battlefield, and he says, you know what, uh, can you just give me a report on uh, how, how are things going out there? He's trying to kind of cover some things up here. And uh, so Uriah gives him the report. And David says to him, he's like, you know what, Uriah? You've been out there battling. You're out there grinding. I just want to bless you. So why don't you just go home, take a shower, spend a lovely evening with your wife? Like, you, you know, you deserve this. So Uriah actually goes against David's commands. He does not listen to him. Instead, Uriah decides to sleep down in the, in the servants' corridors because he says that, you know what? I know all my brothers are out here, and they're battling. It's not over yet. I don't deserve to go home yet. It's not time yet. So then David is like, okay. And rather than being open and honest of what he's done, instead, he takes this even further. The story gets even worse from here, because David talks to Uriah's lieutenant, his commander, and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you guys to go out into the thick of the battle where it's all messy, and I want you to bring Uriah out there, and slowly I want to have all of our men back away, and let's leave Uriah out there. And this is exactly what happens, and Uriah is dead. And then as if this story couldn't get even worse. It, this is a rated R story, by the way. <laughs> Plug your ears, children. That's why we put you over there, okay? Um, is that what, it, what happens next is actually that David um, says to Bathsheba, become one of my many wives. There's a lesson in there. Just get one wife. Stick with that. that that's, that's plenty. That's enough, okay? But he, he says, and then he, he, he has Bathsheba raise their child in the midst of Bathsheba being filled with all this grief of what has happened. So David, at the end of all of this, feels honestly pretty terrible about what he's done, and as he should, I would say. But this morning, I, I want to see ourselves through David's story. I don't want to put, I don't want to elevate ourselves uh, above him. Maybe, maybe our list of, of sins doesn't include uh, uh, all the felonies that David has there. But I want us this morning to think about our own unchecked hearts, 
our own actions and where it could lead us to. And because this morning, I don't want to see any of us heading down a path of destruction. I don't think that's not what I want for you, and it's not what God has for you or for your future. And so this morning, I'm actually gonna, gonna challenge you a little bit in this way, in a different way, is when you hear something good this morning, I want you to say something like, yes, or that's good, or amen, okay? And this is not like for me and for like stroking my ego or something. I want this to be a participation service. This isn't Sleepy Sunday. This is God is alive, and he is true, and he is active, amen? Amen. 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 God has a purpose and a plan for our lives, amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to do a little dialogue here. And, uh, and then next Sunday, we actually have our Vision Sunday. We're going to talk about a lot of stories of what God has done and anticipate towards what he wants to do in our future. That's going to be another opportunity for us to participate in our service together. So would you just uh, close your eyes with me? Let's go to the Lord together. God, I just, I just pray for us this morning that we would fall more in love with you that you would not leave us the same as when we walked in here this morning. We invite you into this place. Amen. Amen. So um, I'd invite you to open up your Bibles to Psalm 51, or we're going to have it on the screen for you here as well. In Psalm 51, this is actually a passage where uh, David has, is just processing what has happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. And you can hear some of the emotion that's going on as I, as I read this. So would you uh, listen to God's word? It says, David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So God, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones you have crushed rejoice again. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now again, when you're reading this, you can like hear the agony, you can hear his embarrassment, you can fear, hear his guilt, you can hear his shame. And again, we, we're kind of like, well, you, you kind of made your bed and now you have to lay in it. Like there's, there's this sense of like, you kind of deserve this. Like if you're going to act that unjustly, this is probably what's going to happen to you. And you know, again, I, I want to make sure we don't start to elevate ourselves above somebody else in this story. I, I love how Pastor Bob has talked about it in, in other uh, stories within Scripture. And it's like if, if we had the same circumstances with the same power and, and the same maybe wandering eye at the wrong moment, we might have made the same mistakes. So again, I want us to not look at our brother's sin or our sister's sin next to us this morning. We're going to look inward, and we're going to do some hard heart work this morning. This isn't the lightest message we've ever had here at Calvary Assembly, but this is a very important thing for us to tackle. We're going to talk about repentance. So first we have to talk about what does repentance mean and what does repentance not mean. Now, repentance does not mean just feeling regret, just feeling bad. Like, I can feel bad about something that I've done, but I can just go back to it and keep doing it over and over again. No, repentance is saying, like, I'm, I'm heading in this direction. I see that it's wrong, and it's an about face. It's a 180. I'm heading the whole different direction now. I'm going away from that thing I was heading towards, and now I'm going towards 
what is good, what is true, what is right, what is noble, what is God's. And so for us today, I, you know, I, I want us to be thinking about that repentance is, it's not just me feeling bad. It's, it's first acknowledging that, okay, there's something wrong, but then repentance actually changes our conduct. It changes our behavior. Every time there's repentance, we are changed, and our actions change as a, re- as a result of it. So it's not just feeling bad. It's saying, I see what is better. I see what is God's way, and now my actions change to become more like him. Because here's the thing I think we don't um, maybe often talk about enough in churches is that sin can feel good for a moment, but the thing about sin is it always leaves us wrapped up in shame. It, It always leads us to the exact same trajectory. And this is actually why God hates sin. God does hate sin. He doesn't hate the sinner. He doesn't hate the person who is sinning. But he knows that sin is always going to lead you into isolation and shame and guilt. And he doesn't want that for you. So he points you to a better, a more hopeful future. And so for us today, we've got to start, and I would encourage you right now, to start thinking about, God, what do I need to repent of in my own heart, in my own life, to fulfill the God-given future that you have for me. And I want every single one of us to be thinking about this, to be wrestling with this. I encourage you to open up your hearts to God because I think he wants to speak fresh to you today. And what I would say is consider the things that you've done that have been out of bounds. Consider uh, the things that you should have done that you haven't done or maybe that you wish you would do in the future. And the other thing we have to do is we actually have to think about the motives behind our actions that we're doing. Are they God-honoring, or do those need repentance this morning? And it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be a little heavy. It's going to end in hope, though. Don't you worry, church. We're going to get through this together. And here's the other thing is, I'm even, we're going to talk about some steps for repentance, and we're going to walk through it all together, and we're all going to repent together today. And I'm going to even help you. I'm going to alliterate it for you. Oh, good news for everybody today. It's not just the gospel that's good news. There's alliteration in the house. Okay, so how do we repent? How do we do this together? Is First is we have to start with reflection. It starts with reflection, and it starts for us in prayer. Repentance is asking God, would you remove the blinders on my eyes and help me see what you see? It's, and for us, we've got we've to take the time to reflect in our lives. And I'm not saying like this is an annual thing. I'm not even saying this is a monthly thing. This is likely a daily thing. Sometimes it's a moment-to-moment thing. And I would encourage you to, to start to think about what could be a rhythm of repentance for your life? Like where are the spots in your day that you could actually do this? Like maybe for you it's that um, it's like first thing when you wake up in the morning. You're going you're gonna to reflect, or maybe it's right before bed, or maybe it's your car ride to work, or maybe it's while you're showering. It's kind of some of that dead time or that quiet time in, in your day, and you're going to think about it. And when you're, when you're thinking about um, reflecting on your day, I want to encourage you, don't just think about the things you did that you wish you would have done differently. I want you to think about the why behind the what. So it's not just the action I did. So, so maybe for me, I blurted out at a coworker or at my kids. And I don't, I don't want to be the kind of person who responds in anger and who lashes out. So I don't want to just think about like, man, I wish I would have done that differently. I want to think, what drove me to respond that way? What is, what is actually driving that? What's the why behind the what? And because for us, I think sometimes we can just think about like our, our actions We don't even think about the motives behind our actions. We could even be doing a good thing for God, but doing it with the wrong motive. That's, we're complicated creatures. (laughs) That's what I can tell you today. So we've got to build in, for us, a rhythm of reflection and prayer, which leads us to our second step, which is recognition. So God shows us something, and we recognize it, and now what are we going to do with it? 
So sometimes for me, what this looks like, like sometimes I recognize this when I'm in prayer. Sometimes it's actually like a circumstance I'm in, or, or sometimes it's my spouse calling me out on something, and sometimes I'm like, yeah, you know what? I do need to repent of that. It could come from a friend. It can come, there's, there's a lot of different directions that God can show us. I know for me, um, even this week uh, when we had Currents, we just watched the video, um, I was, uh, I was actually helping share and facilitate communion. It was a great night of, of worship and healing and, and everything that happened on, on Tuesday night. But I, re- I remember sitting in the front row, and I was singing the songs with my lips, but my mind had actually drifted somewhere completely else. I know this has never happened to you. You would never have your mind drift in the house of the Lord. No, this is the holy 930 service. And I'm not going to say that in any other service. <laughs> um, okay? And so my mind's drifting, and I start thinking about I'm like, oh, man, I had asked somebody to do something, and they didn't really do it. And so now I'm a little bit annoyed, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get this thing done. And, um, and, and I realized that, like, this was actually the, the thing, this was actually something I probably should have done myself. And, and also, not only that, but I, I started to think through, and I realized that three months ago, I had prayed a prayer and asked God, would you grow and cultivate this thing in my life? And now, this thing was right in front of me, and I had this opportunity. And for me, I was sitting there thinking, how ironic. I need to repent of where my heart is going on this. It's not a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. I actually had to repent before I walked up right on this stage earlier this week in a, in a service. And so, like, for me, I, I have this recognition, and I'm like, okay. I just, I went to the Lord. I'm like, I'm sorry, God. Refocus me. Um, get my heart right with you. I want to be aligned with what you have. And uh, I, was, I was on my way with that. Okay? So, Again, it starts with us reflecting, and then we recognize. But it's not enough for us if we just recognize the thing that's wrong. In fact, sometimes for us, we can recognize a thing, and then we actually get fixated on it. And so we keep looking at it in this this sin, maybe, in our life, and we just keep coming back to it. And we keep our eyes fixed on, oh, I just wish I could stop this thing. And we're going to come back to that and how to deal with that. We've got just this recurring sin in our life. But it's not enough if we just reflect and we just recognize. It leads us to our third step. And this is that we have to admit what is just not right. What is just not right in our life. What is actually, dare I say it, sinful in our hearts and in our lives. What is wrong. And, and I know it's not, it's not real popular to make declarative statements in a relativistic culture about what is right and what is wrong. But I will say that what David did to Bathsheba in calling for her, that was, that was wrong. What David did to Uriah to have him killed, that was wrong. And then to make Bathsheba just become one of his 800 wives and raise his kid, like there are, there are certain things in life that are not right. And for us, we can't just look at David and say, like, that's not right. We have to look and acknowledge what is not right within our own hearts and with our own lives. We have to be honest about some of the ugly parts that are inside of us. And we have to, we have to, we have to recognize it. And then we, we can't be wishy-washy about saying, like, well, is that right or, or is that wrong? Because the truth is, is if we keep excusing things, we keep repeating things. If we, keep, if we keep making excuses for what's going on in our hearts and in our lives, we're just going to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over. We actually have to call it out, what it is that's inside of us. We have to be honest. I love what David writes in verse 3. This is in the ESV version of the Bible. It says, For I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. He's recognizing it, and then he's calling it what it is. It's rebellion away from God. And you could see that for him, it's tearing him apart. But what you need to know today is that God can't forgive excuses. God can only forgive sins. So for us, 
We've got to be a church. We've got to be a people who just is real and who is honest with what's going on inside of our lives and call it what it is. Okay, so we've reflected. We've recognized. We have, what do we do third? We call to what's not right. Okay, now we move to point number four. And this is our hardest one. We need to reveal. For us, we have to reveal. We have to confess. And like I said, this is, this is the hardest one. David, David says in uh, verses 3 through 6, he's just writing a confessional of what he has done. And then he actually moves into this place where he's asking for forgiveness of his sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me. Don't look at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. He's asking, starts with confession. He moves towards asking for forgiveness. And maybe you're sitting there saying, you're saying like, well, Jonathan, I, I hear you, and I don't, I don't disagree with you that that would be a good thing, but you don't understand what the fallout is going to be if I actually say what this thing is that's inside of me. And here's what I would say, is that there are consequences to sin. There are ramifications to our actions. And just because you're going through that doesn't mean that, like, God's mad at you. It means we sometimes have to pay for some consequences to some wrongdoing in our lives. But I think we have to also think about it in this way, is how long are we going to just live a life with, with a mask up, trying to prove to somebody else who I am, that you will think I am this person, when are we actually going to start being real and authentic? This is why I love the vision of this house, to be a safe place. Because I believe that there's, there's freedom for us if we are honest with each other. I think, this is why I think uh, James writes in his book, James 5, verse number 16. He says, confess your sins, pray, and you'll be healed. Reveal and there can be healing. And again, I know this part is the very hardest part, but there is freedom in the revealing. As soon as we start to expose our sin from the darkness and we start to expose it to the light, the light cannot be overcome by the darkness. This is where we say amen. Because we, we, we have to be a church that starts to be honest. And here's what I'm not saying about confession. Confession is not going up on your Facebook right after this and typing in your, your deep, dark sins, okay? We, we know Facebook is a place for us to watch videos of bacon-wrapped glazed donut recipes. Like, that's what, that's what Facebook, yeah, right. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook, you guys got to work on this, um, the spot for that. <laughs> Facebook is for your unsolicited political rants. Like, we know what Facebook's supposed to be for. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, no. What I'm not saying is take your confessions um, out to Facebook. What I'm saying is take it to a trusted friend. Take it to a pastor. Take it to a family member that you trust. Take it to um, one of the people in prayer after service. Like, Pray together, declare it together, repent together, and focus on the goodness of what could be in front of you. So the truth is not actually that the ramifications to our sin would be too steep if we were to actually be open and honest about it. The truth actually is, is that sin grows best when it's left unaddressed. That's what's actually true in our hearts and in our lives. But, but we've got to be a people who starts to expose our darkness to the light so that we can find freedom. So maybe you're sitting there and you're like, but Jonathan, I hear you and I, I believe you. I track with you so far, but I have tried and tried and tried again. A hundred times I've tried to repent. I, I just, this thing still has a hold and a grip on me. And what I could say is I feel for you, and, and we're all going to walk through this together. But what I would say is, like, just because you're saved doesn't mean there's not going to be a struggle. Like, we're, you're going to grow, and you're going to keep getting better. What I would tell you is don't lose hope. I love the progression of Psalm 51 because it moves from this place of agony, of defeat, of the sin that has encapsulated David's life, 
and it moves. If you keep reading, I would encourage you, read the rest of Psalm 51 later this week and read 2 Samuel 11 because there's even more details within there. But it moves towards a place of hope. And for you, if you want to actually make sustainable change in your life, you can't do this on your own. And that's what leads us to point number five, is that we have to do this by relying on God. We can't, we can't do this on your own. Maybe it'll last for a day or a week or a month, but it can't be sustainable over the course of eternity if we don't turn towards him. And number four is the hardest point, but number five is the most important point. We, we have to be a people who, who doesn't just look at our sin, we start to fall more in love with Jesus than with the things this world has to offer. In fact, for us, it's that we have to replace our fixation with sin with a fixation on him. Like, that's what it's got to become for us. It's not, if you want to really change, like, you, you have to rely on the character of who God is. That's why I love how, how David starts with, uh, with uh, this Psalm 51. Actually, let's all just read this out loud together. Let's read this. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. You see what David's doing right here? He's looking at who God is, his mercy. He's looking at his unfailing love. He's looking at his compassion. For you, it's not just, you, it's not just about the, the bad thing that you have done in your past. It's about the goodness and the love of who God is. And that's what we start to point towards. That is incredibly hopeful. That no matter how bad the thing is that I did, there's hope for me for a future in Jesus, a healthier future. And my relationship with God can be restored. I can live a life of purpose. I can be a vessel of grace. I can be a person of healing because I've got the living God, the living spirit inside of me. So this is our, this is our progression so far with repentance is that next we, we, we say we're going to rely on God. And it leads us to our last point is this, is that we have to receive forgiveness. We have to receive the gift that God actually has for us. See, the everyday practice of repentance is kind of like, like almost like a mini sermon to ourselves. Because there's, there's actually this, uh, this arc in scripture. This is a real, uh, a real basic thing. But there is creation. Okay, so we start here at creation. And stick with me. Stick with me on this. Okay, so there's creation. Things are created good. And, and, uh, and with order. So God creates his, the heavens, and, and, or sorry, he creates the earth and he creates us. And then next what happens is there's a fall that happens in Genesis 3 and sin invades this world. And then redemption happens at the cross where we are forgiven of our sins. And last, there is restoration. God promises eternal hope and a future for those who love Jesus. And here's the thing. Our repentance actually mirrors this same arc, okay? There's, there's creation. God created us in his image. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? And then we sin. We mess up. We make a mistake. And then it moves us to this place where we need the cross. We need Jesus. And so we have to turn our eyes to him, and it moves all the way to redemption, to a place of a hopeful future for each and every one of us. See, forgiveness is not just what happens when, when, we, when we accept his forgiveness first. Like, we can receive it over and over again. His grace just keeps pouring out on to each and every one of us. And so for us, I'm going to invite us towards repentance today. We're not just going to learn about it. We're going to do it together. Because I think this is, this is what is so incredibly hope-filled today, is that for David, he made these crazy mistakes we talked about, probably worse than all of us, any of us in this room. But here's the thing about what God says about who David was, 
is that God says David was a man after his own heart. Even after all of that, even after all of his past. And the reason for that was not because of David becoming like the best person on earth. The difference for David wasn't in his perfection. The difference is in repentance. So I invite you, would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes this morning? We are going to practice this together. And so what I'm going to just invite you to do is just to spend time with Jesus. I want you to think about repentance. I want you to think about the thing that has maybe gripped your heart and gripped your life that you want freedom from. I'm just going to invite you to bring it to the Lord. And maybe the next step for you after that is, is later today, it, it does look like that reveal. It does look like that confession. Maybe you make a commitment, a stake in the ground that today I'm going to find freedom. It's a decision. I'm going to rely on God for strength because I've tried to do this on my own for far too long. I'm going to receive the forgiveness that he has for me. I'm going to stop talking so you can just be alone with Jesus for a moment. God, I'm thankful that you don't just leave us to a life of guilt and shame and isolation and aloneness, but God, instead, you point us towards a future, a future of freedom, not stuck in bondage, but instead, Lord, we can be free because of who you are and because of what you have done. And so we just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. I'm going to invite you this morning. Would you stand with us? We're going to actually sing this and we're going to declare this out together that we have been rescued, that we have been redeemed, that there is a Savior. He is wonderful and He loves us and His arms are wide open regardless of our past, regardless of what we've done. He says He loves us. Let's sing that truth out together, church.